welcome to Disability oh, Movement, etc. There we go. <laughs> Already interjecting. I'm Dr. Andrew Colombo Dugavito. I'm John Lepke. Acronyms are vaguely unimportant. Yeah. And on today's episode, John and I back together and we'll be changing things up actually a little bit. We're going to do some short topics here at the top where we're going to revisit a conversation that we had about chat GPT and AI. And now that it's been a few months and people have played around with it, we're going to talk about it again. And then there's another story, which is not a great one, but certainly a topic we should discuss is there was an issue (laughs) <laughs> Among many, with the border control in the United States refusing uh, to look at someone's medical information and that person subsequently passing away in their custody. And then, on the second half of the show, John and I are going to be talking about the idea of co-conspirators. And this ties in with the interview that I did. Finally, I did an interview. It took me 13 episodes to get there. But I did it with... Cal Carlton Laster, and I found him by reading articles on Medium, and he had a wonderful article about needing co-conspirators, not allies, and it was particularly framed around his experience as a gay black man in the United States, but our conversation, the one that I had with Cal, uh, we went into depth with how that kind of overlaps with a lot of the stuff that John and I talk about on the show. Uh, So... John, with that, how are you? It's been some time since we've actually recorded a new episode, so what's new? I'm good. I live in a country where you could taste the air at the moment with the wildfires we have across the country. Um, hoping for those to, to die down. We've had some particularly horrifying ones in part of the countries that I'm not in. I'm closest to Alberta and, and Saskatchewan has hosted some some wildfire you know, refugees is probably the best the best term escapees um but some of the fires in Nova Scotia and particularly Quebec at the moment as as news outlets have have sort of globbed onto you know, it looks a tad bit post apocalyptic but you know otherwise um you know coming coming into June here you know it's been I live in a different city than I did last year which I think listeners know. So coming into Pride Month in a new city and gearing up for disability Pride Month in July and just really sinking into a summer where I feel at home. That's fantastic. And you also have some other good news, too, which you've talked about in preparation up to this, where you oh, successfully passed your MFA and are finished. I did. That. I did. That's why I said vaguely unimportant. We'll go back to un- uh, next episode. but. Yes, I defended my Master's of Fine Arts. It has a big, long paragraph of a degree title that I won't bore our listeners with. But yeah, I uh, I defended. You know, some people say these sorts of things are a labor of love. I would call it a labor of attrition. Um, but thanks to the skills of my supervisors um, and the institution letting me continue to pay money to them, I will get to walk across the stage because of when I finished, it will be in the fall. Um, uh, and so that will be a fun closing of a chapter, shall we say? Yeah, sex is a huge, huge accomplishment. So congrats, John. Thank you. And uh, have we talked on the podcast about your equal, much far more exciting academic news? No, absolutely not. I don't think so because it's a very weird thing, but. I was uh, recently promoted to now associate professor with tenure, which means they can't get rid of me so easily anymore, which is nice. But it's a certainly a nice weight off of your shoulders because now it's, uh, you know, the expectation. Well, the expectation to produce is still high, but, you know, you, you've got a little job security, so it's not not quite so <laughs> Uh, terror inducing, but uh, particularly as they have in Texas been debating getting rid of academic tenure in higher education, which is a whole num- another conversation for a whole different type of podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, John. Yeah, it's uh, it's certainly nice, really anticlimactic though, but enjoyable all the same. So now that we got that out of the way, one real quick thing. <laughs> 
is that John and I, in order to try to be a little bit more um, regular with this podcast, a little bit more consistent, I guess I should say, regular didn't sound right, a little bit more consistent is that we are going to be recording episodes on Mondays with the idea to release them sometimes Tuesday mornings. And we'll still keep to, for now, a bi-weekly schedule, so two episodes a month. And if we can do that, then who knows what might happen with this podcast. But now, uh, on to our next thing, on to the things we're going to chat for today to get into it. And we first wanted to bring up, revisit our discussion about AI and ChatGPT. And I wanted to talk about this for a brief minute or two, just because... When we first chatted about it, people were, let's say, more or less alarmed, quite hyperbolic in in their idea of what AI can do or could do potentially. And there's a lot of people, I think, particularly upset with the idea that AI could could eventually just start generating all these things and fake information, which is certainly a, a possibility. As as I know, there are at least a couple examples of it. You know, sort of an innocuous one: the the AI generated Pope. With mm. the big puffy jacket. Yeah, you know, I was that thinking was... of the lawyer that blew up his own career. Oh, I didn't even hear about that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, there's a lawyer that filed a brief with cases that didn't exist because he was using J- oh, uh, ChatGPT for... Uh, for uh, That's for even a worse crap. example. Wow. Yeah, but I, I think for us, uh, I think the piece you and I touched on a lot was less about the issue with AI taking over things or even being used inappropriately, like just filing legal briefs without actually checking them. As we, I think, talked a little bit more on the accessibility side of of chat GPT and AI. And I think that as as have sort of borne out over the last few months now that people have started playing with it, seems much more like an application for AI technologies, even chat GPT or or the others that, uh, you know, are generative image, text-to-image type of of things. And I mean, I think some of the pushback uh, being sort of our fear that we've given ourselves through all the different types of sci-fi movies we watch <laughs> and, you know, either The Terminator, The Matrix, or any of the um, iRobot, right, sort of have a fear of this AI ultimately becoming sort of sentient. And at least from what I've seen is we're way off from that. Um, in, and in kind of having a fear of AI, I think we sort of overlook some of the ways it already is incorporated with us, right? I mean, you, when we chatted about this earlier, John and Prep, you mentioned the whole, um, like we're talking over Zoom, and they have built-in captions using Otter AI, which is sort of a speech-to-text AI generator that's been around for some time and has actually only gotten better since this sort of chat GPT and, and all the other ones have come on board is now that that Otter AI now gets better because it can use some of those language models that they've based chat GPT on. And it just, we just have a better ability because, um, you know, I know from doing this podcast as well as, you know, trying to self archive a lot of presentations that I've done in the past, transcription takes a really long time. And up until I'd say probably the last year, maybe year and a half, um, all of the sort of AI sort of quick ways to get transcriptions were really bad. And they're, they're still not great, right? You know, Otter, can, Otter continues to be a challenge, particularly if, you know, it's fine for, you know, you and I talking, but if we use a, a niche disability word or um, particularly with accents, whether that's sort of what we can you know, typically think of in terms of accent or in terms of like a, a deaf accent. Uh, I continue to argue that many people with CP and vocal involvement have an accent, but, you know, I'm not a linguist. I think for me, what the thing is, we're struggling, like I, I am, if you had to put me on the timeline of, you know, pro versus anti-GPT, obviously GPT is having an effect on the industry that I work, in, right? It's having an effect on creative. What I think we struggle with as a society is that, like I said, we don't identify where AI already exists, right? We use autocomplete on our phones. We don't think of that as like 
some giant affront to our ability to communicate, right? You, you, the captions, we don't we don't think about like, I mean, in the same way that technically speaking, if you're writing an essay in university, if you're writing an exam in university, you're supposed to turn off the autocorrect on the Word document. How many students actually do that? Um, you know, let's let's be on. So uh, I think we just don't have as good of a societal understanding of AI. What I'm worried about, even within the access conversation, is people explaining it away in the name of access. Because we have a history as a disability community or set of communities of instead of saying, oh, we're in conflict, like there's an accessibility conflict or there's an accessibility, um, you know, we're bumping into some accessibility barriers. We just go, well, it's accessibility. And so you should just let me do whatever I want. You know, that that is a concern for me when it comes to to generative AI. And certainly within the creative industries, what I worry about, especially with my colleagues in journalism, is a forest for the trees, right? That we're so worried about it, that we spend so much brain space worrying about it, that we don't put it in our work to either safeguard ourselves against it or work, find more clients that are also anti-GPT. I'm certainly signing contracts now that say, hey, anti-GPT like GPT is plagiarism, don't do it. And also don't use a number of these tools that are using AI to suggest, right? Um, I mean, even the the tool that we use to organize the podcast, Notion, for some reason has an AI. Like, it's become, like, in vogue. And I think pessimism and anxiety are fair. What I worry about is the, the paralysis of analysis on the individual person. I cannot control that BuzzFeed decides to eliminate their news. I cannot control them trying to change their quiz to AI. What I can control is finding clients who I align with. That's always what business is about. So, you know, you can you can choose to build, you can choose to destroy everybody else in town, or you can choose to try to build the biggest building, right? Um, and and I think that AI, the anxiety of academia. I thought it was summed up perfectly by a Linus Tech Tip podcast clip, which is called The Wayne Show, where they said, you know, shock, surprise, students use cheating machine to cheat. Like, this happened. Like, why, why don't we look at the root causes of why, you know, generative AI is being used? It's, it's for that speed and, and reliance on things. It's sort of the the tech evangelist that you've got to worry about the um, the the uh, you know AI is the future because too often with these you know the tech bros or the business bros there is this sort of like well they come up they say they have such a great track record because they hit seventy percent on these things but they're making eighty predictions a day right same reason why I used to be anxious about sometimes about how the concept of disabled oracles was being deployed. Like if we say enough things, we're going to be right sometimes. Um, that doesn't mean we're always right, <laughs> which is how it's being co-opted. I'm not, I, I'm aware that people behind disabled oracles, now the disabled oracle society don't think disabled people are always right. Um, but that sort of generative AI, you know, what happens, for example, when somebody gets the bright idea to say, hey, chat GPT, write me an accessibility plan. Like, it's going to be god awful, right? So, well, yeah, that means one or two of those things may be okay, right? And I think that's that to me has always been kind of the root of the issue is that <laughs> I mean, most humans like to do things as quickly and easily as possible, right? We we like the shortcut always, and I think AI can be great for starting those ideas. So maybe. John, in, in that example, you could say, hey, give me, you know, an accessibility plan. And that might be a good start. But then you need to go into that document and actually use some critical thought and go, does this actually make sense? Because that's what AI can't do. Can, can I play devil's advocate for a second? Yeah, go for it. I would argue that around something like an accessibility plan, if you're using generative AI for the first draft, you already aren't showing a commitment to the practice that you are doing. Even if you think it's not you specifically, royal you, if you think it's creating a good baseline, 
you actually haven't done the research or hired the people or done the thought to figure out where it works for your local context. Because I guarantee if I write, I mean, I shouldn't say guarantee because God knows I haven't done it. If I write accessibility planning, I'm guessing it would spit back ADA at me. Probably. Yeah. And you're right. Yeah, it's where that information comes from. Remarkably, well, in a lot of ways, useless on the side of the border and useless in the majority of the developed world. And so, yeah, because we see this all the time. If you look at like land acknowledgements in Canada and the copy and pasting, I liken it to if you've ever looked at the animal bylaw. I haven't looked at Denton's, but if you look at the animal bylaws, they're usually copied from other jurisdictions and then never deleted of anything. So, like, it's illegal to own a seal in Saskatoon. I don't, I don't know, I don't know who's bringing a seal to the middle of the Canadian prairies, but like, it just, you know, it's good reason it's you illegal. You can't have more suit, you know, you can't have a kangaroo. Like, it's just, it's all added and added and added and added. You end up with these land acknowledgments that are like so tone deficient because they're just copied and pasted. And I think that's where that intersection with generative AI and, and disability is really white, dare I say, scary, because we know that the people who are going to deploy those tools probably aren't the disabled people or the ones in the know, whether they're allies or whatever else. They're the people who go, ah, it's a checkbox. I got to have one. I know what I'll do. I'll ask open AI, right? Um, and not do the work. Yeah, you're right. Because we know, I mean, those all those algorithms, all those language models learn from the internet. That's why they've been able to get so good so quickly is because there's, I mean, 40 years essentially of data for them to use. But bigger problem we know is <laughs> just how racist, ableist, homophobic, sexist, all of it that the internet really is. I mean, just... A few years ago, I I remember, I can't remember which company tried to do it, but they, maybe it was an early version of Watson or something like that, where they trained, maybe it was a Twitter chatbot, I can't remember exactly, but they trained this model to like, hey, I'm going to let this chatbot out in the world and you can talk to it and it'll respond. And within like two minutes, it was spitting out, like they had to shut it down because it was spitting out like the most racist stuff yeah possible. i think that's the one where it was trying to impersonate it was supposed to like model a 17 year old girl and then it was like you know there's multiple examples of this retelling but... the history of world war ii in a certain light you know yes um, yes yeah, exactly. and, and i think that the the i mean there are a whole there are researchers dedicated to algorithmic ableism and how it particularly filters into medical stuff you know the more we hear about ai and and, and the medical field and sort of this often lack of a critical eye, just because you can do something <laughs> doesn't mean you should. And um, that's the next stage. But when we go wholly all AI bad, we sort of fail to acknowledge how it's already intersecting with our life. Like if you can't see it, it's sort of like when people complain about privacy and they should complain about privacy, like data privacy. But they'll do it from like, you know, sent from my iPhone on an unsecure network or something, right? There's a, there's a disconnect. And again, like media literacy, for example, we don't do a good job, you know, in anywhere I've ever lived about talking about these things. And, and when the main voice is the evangelists, um, and I use that term because that's the term they often use internally for the people selling the product. Yeah, and that's how they how they pitch it. The, the let's just turn over everything to the tech world, and then we'll, the decisions will be made. And it's like, well, <laughs> n- nah, not in a good way. Not Elon in the way Musk we think. Neuralink. I think I'll pass. Yeah, especially the. <laughs> I saw a report of just how many car crashes there are with a, a co-pilot driving Teslas, and how many have caught on fire, and the fact that can't even make a door handle that functions appropriately. I don't want him putting anything into my head at the moment. So, but the problem is, is I, I do generally see potential for software such as that, that, or or a device such as that for someone who may have had a spinal cord injury in order to sort of help 
bring back any sort of form of motor control they may have had prior to their injury or someone who, um, you know, in all, all other ways is a tetraplegic that has very sort of little hand or, or leg mo- mobility or function. And so they can use a device like that to help move their chair and and then you know that how these things all go, and then you then you get, you bump into the sort of like oh this will be the miracle thing right the age old thing of the rehab center being named after walking again and um, yeah some of, some of the rehab centers in the U S have some pretty hilarious names um, oh yeah and it's all it's based in the medical model it's all in the curative narrative and things like that and and for sure speaking the, of oh okay yeah and I was just gonna say with um, with that, the I mean, even the idea of uh, we have things like cochlear implants, right? We sort of we have these types of of devices already that you know, we know it, are problematic. Some yes, all, that still have their own problems. Problematic. Yes, and and some I mean, even cochlear implants are not one hundred percent effective all the time, right? So there's going to be these devices which come along and use likely use some form of AI technology built into them, right, to help synthesize speech or to help, um, you know, translate speech into motor function or whatever it might be. Uh, it's not going to cure, quote unquote, cure everyone. It's not going to fix everybody's potential issues. It might work for some. Some people may uh, find that they had a better quality of life before that device. And sp- yeah, yeah I think the, you were transitioning to this. Microsoft yeah. product. Like, seeing ai like it doesn't claim to cure like a lot of these products when sensibly deployed aren't aren't claiming to make the curative thing but the challenge is how are they deployed and and how are they seen and how are they sort of do yeah deployed is the right word by people who want to push a certain narrative around disability um and there's just so many you know conflicting spaces where that can slam together because historically disabled people haven't loudly been in the tech field you know i've got to i've got to write pieces and and speak to a number of folks and you know we're still i mean recency bias aside we're still we're still in that stage where disability is not ubiquitous with program design and so how how this all gets deployed is is going to be really really interesting but i do i'm not sure that a place of pure pessimism which i think is where you and i you know are sometimes agreement, are. not sure that a pure place of pessimism try saying that three times fast is going to is actually going to create the accessibility we need a healthy dose of pessimism and you know i default to can we do this with a human rather than ai but but uh you know when the leaders of ai historically are saying oh we've got to regulate this we've got to do this that and the other thing what this is all very scary because none of these booms really foresaw the amount of silicon valley money being pumped into them you know got to take a pause i think this is not transition but taking a pause right moving to the second second story we had was an ap article from a couple of uh, well actually yeah week or so ago, about 10 days ago, um, about the Border Patrol in the U.S. not actually wouldn't refusing to review a medical file of a eight-year-old girl who had come across the border uh, with her parents and she had a chronic health condition and a rare blood disorder. Uh, and apparently the child's parents had shared that medical history about a month earlier in May when they were taken into custody after crossing the border, but apparently the um, Border Patrol never looked at it. And the girl apparently uh, had a seizure and died on her ninth day in custody. And that's that's what we know from an internal investigation. And, um, I mean, it's a horrifying story. She had shown a fever of 104 degrees which the report says, and that was, of course, in Texas, which is where it's already hot. Um, And the girl was, (laughs) not only did they not review her medical file, and this happened to her, but she was uh, was in custody for almost a week longer than 
the agency's own limit of about 72 hours. So (laughs) this is just horrifying. But in terms of disability and migrants, I don't feel that it is uncommon of a practice to refuse someone an accessibility, to refuse to look at someone's medical file, to provide medical um, care in a way that's humane, right? That's that's well, justifying them for a person. And in, in immigration policy more generally, I, you know, if I was not born with the citizenship, if I was not born with the citizenship that I was, so I'm a dual citizen, British and Canadian. When I moved from the UK, if I, at the time, they've changed it slightly since, but at the time when I moved in 2004, I would not have been eligible to move if I was not a citizen, despite the fact that I'm moving within the Commonwealth, et cetera, et cetera. I, I was too, I'm too much of a drain on the system, essentially. That's, that's shifted a little bit, but not a whole heck of a lot. We see particularly lots of students who are trying to go to, you know, grad student. I'd like to stay here, so bumping into some some pretty awful requirements around health and and making assumptions, you know, based on based on their their disabilities. Um, we're starting to hear more about Quebec border, and there's been lots of arguments over the last two years about the um, uh, as a called the Third Country Act, right? The, the agreement between the U.S. and Canada around you know. Um, whether you can go via one to get to the other for for refugee status yeah yeah you have to you have to apply at the closest country yeah. whatever yeah it's yeah it's very, these, just... these systems these systems are biased against disabled people even when it is when we, even when we're talking about immigrants that the country quote unquote white disabled wants. folks right yeah. white disabled people white from Europe. white yeah uh, well I, even you know when i say the country wants you know even the ones that score you know all of these systems have points and all the rest of it you know massive shutdown and then even when you see people coming into the country what often gets forgotten about is you know, the supports outside of that is the education system set up is for for an influx of people is the, you know, the the social services organizations and the nonprofit sector that so often holds up our systems here when it comes to to immigration. Those systems are not well enough resourced. Those conversations are not had. The disability conversations are not had. And then oftentimes there are, particularly in Canada, there are there are groups um, that that do get, you know, do get, I want to say positive treatment, but, you know, we've seen over a number of wars, Canada decide to put that we are peacemakers, we identify with our national identity. You know, oh, look how many people we're bringing in, but then how many supports are there for them, really? Um, and And... You know, I'm outside of that fear in, in some ways. But it's it's not Canada sucks at talking as always. Canada will point to American foreign policy and go, well, we're not as bad as them. And you're like, well, no, actually, you borrowed their playbook. And then put a slightly socialist spin on it to make yourself feel better. But, you know, if you ask the average Canadian, hey, how much does an ER stay cost if you aren't a citizen, they wouldn't know, right? You know, there are, there have been movements in the past, I can't remember if it passed, but not in Saskatchewan, I don't think, but in in neighboring provinces around taking, making it harder for international students to receive, um, to receive public health care. Oh, sure. And they can only work certain hours, maximum number of hours. Yeah, you can only work, you can work, don't quote me, but there's huge barriers in terms of th- there's a difference between how many hours you can work on campus versus off campus. Um, we had a case in Saskatchewan where two two women were way over their limit. Canada tried to deport them and they were in a church for a year and a half before finally being deported and then being readmitted. It's all 
But Canada likes to believe itself to care about people when it comes to immigration policy. And they sort of, in my view anyway, they rely on the positive vibes, if we can call it that, from the way um, they acted in certain times in the 20th century. They welcomed in the Mennonites, for example. I have a Mennonite last name. At, at part, and Mennonite family members in the you know the earlier part of the 20th century. You know, but but if you ask the average Canadian university student, do they know about you know internment camps that existed here for for Asian Canadians? Do they know about the violence of the railroad? No, because they always just point like, well, we're not the American. Like, look what the Americans were doing in the same period. And you're like, no, no, we were doing it too. And we didn't apologize for, you know, another, I can't remember when the apology came for, for the railroad, but in, in the 21st century, I'm fairly sure. And so, yeah, it's, it's hard not to look at these sort of border, uh, these border conversations. Even in the article that you shared in the AP, the American government, you can tell border officials aren't desperate to show this as a one-off. But if you turn on a e or TLC or one of these channels that has these border control documentaries, you know, it doesn't take, it's not an exception. It's quite obviously not an exception. And it's really hard to take officials seriously on. They say, this is a tragedy that we will make sure it will never happen again. Would you know, there are videos of kids locked in cages. <laughs> like, and it's and I mean, it doesn't even have to be that viscerally bad to know that how disabled people are treated by the immigration system is awful, particularly if they come from countries that are predominantly Spanish speaking or are, as you say, very melanated compared to other parts in the world. But even if you take that away, if you truly even something that could exist, you know, a color blind, race-neutral system of in immigration, which I don't think is at all possible. Um, disabled people coming from even the most affluent countries in the world couldn't, or in many ways can't, come. I mean, even from the I outgo. In, I read something somewhere, and don't quote me on this, but I'm fairly sure I'm ineligible to move to New Zealand. Now, I'm not planning yeah. on doing that. You have to have a certain... But I think have brain I forgot what rules me out. I think brain damage rules me out or something. Like it's and New Zealand system. is sort of the the you know pinnacle well, of put on progressive. the pedestal anyway. Yeah. That's what yeah, we like it, to think. It's one of those things where immigration and disability is one of those systems where you don't you don't know what it's like until you intersect with it. And like I said, I didn't have to my parents have to intersect with it, but I did. Then the question becomes how do we build an equitable immigration system for disabled people? And I think part of that is making clear that this actually does happen all the time. Maybe not to this extreme all the time, right? But in terms of the, you know, system puts somebody through so much stress that it negatively impacts their health and shortens, if not their lifespan, certainly reduces their quality of life. It happens all the time. Right. If if the system itself isn't giving them a disability when we're talking about mental health concerns or, you know, they're fleeing persecution from another country that's already given them PTSD or some such similar condition. Yeah, I think it's that baseline level of knowledge, but easy for me to say. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think another potential aspect of this, too, is just how not just how disability is not being accounted for uh, in the immigration processes, whether you are coming through an established method that we would quote unquote called, you know, legal immigration, which by the way, what this child did with her parents is a legal form. They, they came and were, were seeking asylum. You cannot seek asylum unless you are actually in the country in which you are trying to seek asylum. So there is no other way to do this. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, all the people who have to come here because that is that is the established method. I mean, I can just think about perhaps those who may have physical impairments in Colombia or in Panama that can't make a five, 6,000-mile journey 
to the southern border of the United States. Um, and so they're not even being represented in this potential aspect. But then, you know, we do hear stories like this. And you're right. In the AP article, you see every single statement coming from some official going, we're completely flabbergasted. We're, we're going to get to the bottom of this. We're going to find out. And they never do. They say that and we forget about it. And I think that's why I particularly wanted to bring this up is because we can't accept that anymore. It's just the response. Oh, we'll look into you know what happens. This is the only time we've got countless examples and probably even more that we haven't heard of that that don't make the news because they maybe aren't quite so visceral of a story that it, you know, an eight year old child dying in custody like that should draw our emotions. If it doesn't, I worry. <laughs> Check your pulse. You might not be with us anymore. But, um, you know, just thinking of all the other potential individuals that may come through that may have things like diabetes, or you're right, like certain forms of mental health that need medical prescriptions or some kind of drugs to help cope or, or you know, balance out whatever somebody's going through. If somebody doesn't get their diabetes or di medication, if they're, they're insulin for their diabetes, while in custody, like, let alone have a hundred degree heat, et cetera, et cetera, you're going to run into issues all over the place. So... Obviously, we have no answers for that, John, but I think hopefully keeping this up and, and chatting about it, people will at least keep their ear on it, too. Because I know, and I think you're, you're right, in Canada, sometimes people can not think about the border, right? Not think necessarily about immigration because you sh really share your border with us in the U.S. And, you know, I know a lot of my progressive friends say they're going <laughs> to leave the border, but, you know, that's not really what what's going on in the Canadian border. And then, of course, although we talked a whole lot more about the border when, when the previous person was in office, but even under Democrats, Obama, Biden, Clinton, Clinton started it, right? Our border idea, our ideas of border security are just so way off, right? But with that, we're going to take a break. When John and I come back, we're going to be talking about co-conspirators, why we need more of them, and less allies. Yeah. Hey, John. So I brought this article in from Carl Laster, and I interviewed him for the show, so we'll get to hear that. But I wanted to chat with you a little bit before we hear his and my interview. <laughs> In talking about the idea of co-conspirators, because as you mentioned at the top of the show, right, we are in Pride Month. February is Black History Month, the API Month, uh, I think was March. Autistic, Autism Awareness, or whatever we call it now, is May, April. And we're going to be into, what is it, Disability, Disability Pride Month? Yeah, Disability Pride Month in July. And this piece that, that Carlton wrote, um, I found particularly interesting because he called out the idea of allyship. Um, and, and being an ally, of course, is been or becoming a little bit more of a contentious issue. I think particularly because, you know, predominantly folks that look like us tend to self-identify their allyship. As, yeah, and, they want as as one of my friends used to put. They want their ally cookie. Yeah, they, and I think I even heard um, somebody at one point say that the A and LGBTQIA was for ally and not asexual. So anyway, Carlton's piece is about pride and uh, and living in America as a black man, which there's lots of intersections. Of course, he does a much better job than I could ever do talking about it. But there's one piece that stood out for me that I highlighted. And it was, he was talking about sort of this idea of kind of as everything was going down, I guess, in 2020, when we had George Floyd and a lot of the other, um, you know, sort of sensationalized killings in that summer and how everybody was Black Lives Matter, right? And he wrote that there is no performative alliance with Black civil rights community on their part which is unlike others who have done so to boost sales, garner votes, deflect questions regarding questionable personal relationships, 
or to walk back relationships when things got uncomfortable, either they diminished their power or they threatened protection and their safety of their own whiteness. And I think that, to me, really summed it up because you have politicians, <laughs> you have celebrities, we have organizations that perform some sort of allyship. Target, for instance, being an example where I, I can recall at least for every year for the last four or five years that Target in all their stores during Pride would have Pride gear and Target branded Pride things. And, you know, we can talk about the consumerism, but the fact is, is at least it showed people who felt discriminated for for their sexuality. It showed that they could shop there and it was com and it was comfortable. And then they get this year they had a whole bunch of flack from the far right in the United States and they said, okay, we're gonna sort of back off <laughs> selling this pride stuff. And it just really showed how commercialized it is and just how performative it really is. Um Carlton mentions Taylor Swift, for example, as someone who sometimes will come out and say these things about, you know, pride or even things, feminist kind of ideals, support for women, but yet very rarely would give up what he would consider her safety of whiteness to be a co-conspirator, right? And the idea that he brings forth with co-conspirator is like, it's one thing to be supportive of these groups. It's one thing to say that you are pro-choice, or it's one thing to say you're pro-LGBTQ, or you're pro-Black, or you're pro-Muslim, or pro-whatever, right? Pro-disability, right? <laughs> Which is a weird thing to say also, like, yay, pro-disability. But you don't ever you don't ever get yourself dirty, right? You're once stuff starts going down or once there starts to be just a little pushback, oftentimes allies will resort to those previous privileges, which predominantly is whiteness and sort of retreat to that without ever giving that piece up. And I think that is particularly salient within the disability rights, disability justice types of community, and particularly those folks who might consider themselves allies of those communities. Um, yeah. I, yeah, for me, absolutely. And I also think for the end of piece, and I looking forward to the, uh, to the interview that you did. I think you're exactly right that, that people want to self-describe themselves as allies without recognizing the second piece of that. Like, okay, if I'm an ally, what am I doing? Am I, am I challenging my kid's school board to allow pride event? I don't know. I don't have a kid. But, you know, this is just, you know, am I challenging, even if I am not, and this is, connects to my crip of the week later in the episode, am I, even if my kid isn't disabled, am I challenging the fact that a number of states still don't have disabled athletes that are allowed to compete at high school track meets. What am I doing to, in a way, earn that title? The only caveat that I have around disability, and I don't know if this came up in your interview because little oh, behind the scenes listeners, I have not heard it yet, is that oftentimes I find, I shouldn't say often, a significant enough amount of the time that it bears repeating. <laughs> I know a lot of people who conceived of themselves as allies first, and then came to understand themselves as disabled once they were encircled in that like, oh, I'm I'm welcomed in as an ally. Cool. Oh, actually, you know, oh, neurodivergent describes these things that because of the generation I was in or whatever, the protectionism of my parents, not mine, this is a hypothetical person, that they like see themselves in that. I think co-conspiracy, you're exactly right, links in with, you know, the ADA, you know, the 70s and 80s protests, independent living movement on both sides of the border. And I think what it helps us give us words for is knowing that different people can take different roles, find that there is a heavy bias still, and doesn't matter really what 
what marginalization you have, there's still a heavy bias towards boots on the ground action. And, and what we tend to forget oftentimes, even in disability community is that like, I've often described myself as a boardroom advocate. I've gone to entire like activism based things like events where every session is about how to stay safe at a protest. And then like, none of this actually relates to me because you're like, here's how to run away from the cops. And like, they, there are videos of people just being pushed out of their chairs. Like I am not, it's not, it's not going to happen. I think co-conspirator allows us to think in terms of access need. And it allows us to think, right, I'm trying to help somebody create change in a way that is accessible to them. Like you said, how can I use my privilege? Or what I often think about is how do I, how do I use my skills? So, for example, if I know an activist, hypothetically, again, if I know an activist who is multiply marginalized and disabled, and I know that they want to make change, and they're very much that, like, boots on the ground person, but perhaps they're not as comfortable. They need to write that very forward but not rude email to somebody. I know I'm good at writing that. <laughs> and I don't go, oh, I must tone police you to make sure that you can write this letter. I go hey, send me your really angry letter and let's find it Find it so that it makes change in this particular context. Yeah, or without pissing anybody Or let's connect out. you to yeah, other yeah. people that I know because I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm on the periphery of these conversations just by nature of the friends that I have. Let me find you somebody who's better at this than I am or who knows more people. Or oftentimes this shows up for me in terms of like, because of Parasport, I'll see a random tweet on the internet that is like, I need to find a wheelchair. And I'll be like, well, through this person I played basketball with 12 years ago and this person who I still chat to, I know that this organization provides this. And I get a very like, how do you know all that? But I don't think of myself in terms of allyship, particularly because to me, allyship, like you said, can be a very passive practice. And there are times where I think passiveness and help, like being the person where they can, somebody can bounce something off of you and you don't have like an, there is not a rush to be active in the fight necessarily. But it, that, that jump to co-conspirating is really important because it, it, it actually puts on display the sort of combative nature of change and that a, a board meeting can be as combative as, as the you know, the activism on the ground, we need to learn better as a disability community, I would argue, especially with the interplay between to LGBTQ plus community and disability community. I have a number of friends who say, you know, joke around that that Venn diagram is almost a circle. That we need to understand where those connect and, and where we can have additional learnings. And, you know, from a research perspective, we both did graduate degrees. The you know, and I think I've said this on the podcast before, the interplay between crip theory and queer theory, the intersection between communities, the fact that often lumped together in, in various research segments, like, well, we can't sit here, particularly as white disabled people, and say, you know, we are, we are the lords of all marginalization. Um, we need to, and we also need to support, one of the things I think about recently is we need to support our, I say colleagues, but friends. This is, doesn't have to be super academic, you know, for having those difficult, supporting those difficult conversations about things like accessibility at Pride. Because I can tell you, it often falls by the wayside in terms of like wheelchair accessibility and things like that. Yeah, I, don't, I think I was I was at the Pride event uh, here in Denton over the weekend, and. Uh, they didn't have a sign language interpreter. You know, there were maybe, I mean, there were most likely more than about 100 people or more downtown, and they were having a speaker up there in the event. And, you know, that's just one aspect, but very much overlapped. Yeah, or, or I would argue that disability community really, really needs to learn from, from to social BCQ community, pride community, about how to, well, two things. How to traverse the lack of elders, because in conversations I have, disability community is, is learning from, you know, the conversations that have been had, you know, by far not an expert on this, but sort of the lost generation that we have from, from the, you know, 
80s and 90s in that community and how we're still as a disability community wrangling the fact that, you know, the people who should be 70, 80, 90, most of them still were in an era of institutions. And the second thing, and you've got my mind going about co-conspirating, is how can we better reduce the amount of disability event is that re- still rely on alcohol. Every sporting event ends with a banquet that unless the athletes are underage, is an excuse to drink and drink with the ref. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And, like, and I mean, that, that also goes to a conversation I know we had a few episodes ago with the idea of addiction and disability and how that all inter- intersects. Right. And, and I think with this idea of allyship and co-conspirator, um, the, the one thing that Carlton brought up was, was sort of the idea of allyship, though at, at some point perhaps it meant something different. It has certainly become like if you, I don't want to say that there aren't allies doing good work or people that say they're allies that do good work. But most of the time, people who say, yes, I'm an ally they tend to center themselves in that community work, right? Which is sort of the antithesis of what you actually want to do, right? That is, that's the white saviorism. That's the the idea of, particularly if somebody says, I'm an ally, but yet what they're doing in a certain space is the opposite of what that group is actually wanting or saying they need. It creates a great amount of friction and, and turns people off. And So the advice that I got from Carlton was basically like, if you want to help support groups, um, and just as you said, John, using what you have, using your skills is absolutely important, right? We, like you said, we need to have conversations that are difficult in boardrooms about these topics, not just the visual protests, right? Because disabled folks, queer folks, black people, women, they don't tend to be in those spaces or when they are, they already feel like an outsider. So if you are someone in that space who might consider themselves an ally, going that further step to being a co-conspirator is to speak up and use your position in that place when you hear things that may be ableist or sexist or racist or whatever. And it's uncomfortable, (laughs) Because you you are often having to confront somebody that maybe within the own in the own heart hierarchy has more quote unquote accumulated power, whether it's by title or age or gender or or what have you. Um, but as someone who does have a lot of privileges, such as myself, um, using those intentionally in spaces helps shift conversations, right? And it helps it so that. When you do help make a bigger table, (laughs) because the table, we get this idea that the table is only as big as it is, and we can't make it any bigger, which means including more people means that others get excluded. Well, we made up the table so we can make the table fucking bigger, right? (laughs) Or we can, or we can drag this metaphor on longer than maybe it needs to we can make the table the size it needs to be for the situation and oftentimes we run into things in disability and community where people are invited into conversations about a certain segment of access where they have no experience but it because they are disabled they get to just talk about it we don't have a good conversation about like actually it We want to hear from the people with the lived experience of this thing. I'm going to borrow, and I think I've said this on the podcast before, but I'll borrow from another community. Of course, each community within, and again, white, uh, I am a white, but one of the phrases that that I really identify in these conversations is, um, you know, it's not, and this is borrowed from, from indigenous community, various communities will have different ways of saying this, but the one that was shared with me is was essentially it's not who you claim, it's who claims you. We have a large issue at the moment with particularly some academics falsely making it sound like they are indigenous for clout, essentially. And, and you know, I, I get, uh, I, for one, you know, the capitalism aspect that, that Carlton talked about, I keep seeing sports organizations that I follow, like, 
change the logo and it'd be sports where nobody has ever come out in their sport until they're retired. And I yeah. go, I think there's one gay, out, doing it like to openly do it. gay. There's like one openly gay NSGL player. And I think he plays for like the Nashville Predators. And he mentioned that, yeah, it was nice, right? They, I think the Predators changed their logo and they wore like a pride, they had a pride day at the, the arena or whatever. But it's, I mean, it is one guy and yet the whole NFL or the whole NHL does this. And I mean, I get it. They're a business. They got to make money. And, you know, up until really the last year, doing pride nights, doing whatever breast cancer nights where they all wear pink or um, breast awareness month, I think is the other one where they wear like pink. NFL does it, I think. And so there is these performative things, but then the issue is, is when they get any bit of pushback, <laughs> they just drop it all together. Right. Uh, and I, I'm thankful. I think at least the NH NHL has been pretty consistent, like keeping with it. Although I'm not sure, maybe it's a lie. No, they backed off and I, I didn't see anything beyond the one they and... they sort of handcuffed themselves by saying the athletes can choose not to wear et cetera. Oh, shit. So, so, fuck the so, NHL then. Um, with the warm up jersey and stuff. I think it it's uh, as I try to open a candy without making too much noise on the podcast. I feel like I'm in a class somewhere. Like I feel the same way about people in my that I know personally who will publish those things that say, "Just so you know, I'm safe to come out too." And I'm like, but are, you are don't you? get to decide that. <laughs> exactly. And just because you're safe for one person, like if we if we take the the aspect that I have no lived experience with, if we just say if we flip it to I'm a safe person to come out with as disabled, how how do you know that? Like if you and I didn't know each other, how would how would you know that I was safe to talk to about like ADHD and and related and and neurodivergence? Aside from the fact that we're two, like, yappy athletes, like... I'm pretty open wouldn't, about it. Right? Yeah. It, it, it's a remarkable presumption of privilege to go, I am safe to, to do this with. No, you actually have to do the work. Um, yeah, you, you create know, the space and, and the person, right? The, the, the other person, the not person, you, the other person. They're the one to decide if it's safe enough or not, right? And, and no, and, of course... Lots of these people who are sharing these things, I believe, are people who are safe to come out to. But again, not not my – it's when it's the solo indicator, right? Or when you only see it in June. And you're like, eh, <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. This, this, I've seen this checkbox narrative before. Yeah. And I, maybe to close, close our conversa bit of conversation on this, I think for those people who – maybe there's some listening. Maybe there's some folks who've, who – are now thinking a little bit and going, oh, maybe I might fall into that group. I, th I think the folks who put that type of information out there, you know, or they're the, they're the people who share the hashtag that's in vogue at the moment, or they do the thing, they show up at the women's march, uh, but they don't necessarily engage in the everyday conversations with their local city workers or, th or moments like that, or they kind of tune out and other times. I think those folks might be the sleeper cells, right, for co-conspirators, right? They're sort of the most, like, inclined potentially to take that extra step. And so, unfortunately, it can't, the onus is not on the groups, the marginalized groups, to get allies to be co-conspirators. And I, I thank Carlton for writing his piece and for talking with me about it so openly and for our conversation that you'll hear in a minute. But, but folks actually have to go out and do it. Like you, and if you don't know how, here's a little plug. Have you stick around for the next 30 minute conversation I have? Um, there are pretty easy steps you can do to, to move from allyship to co-conspiratorship. And so I'm sure this is going to be a continued topic. Um, John, did you have anything else to add? No, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I think the more that we can do to, to collaborate with the community is there to understand those intricacies from a person to person conversation perspective rather than like a broad shot Twitter perspective, the better off we will be. Excellent. All right. Well, when we come back, you will hear my interview with Carlton Lester on why we need more co conspirators and less allies. Hey 
Hey, welcome back to Disability Movement, etc. I am Dr. Andrew Colombo Dugavito, and I am presently with Carlton Laster. Carlton wrote the piece that John and I were talking about in the last segment, and we thought it would be really helpful to have Carlton on with us to give us just more in-depth and and perhaps try to make some connections with disability, including the identities in which he talked about in his piece. So Carlton, thank you so much for joining. For those of you who don't know you or haven't read your work, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do day to day? And more importantly, how are you? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I appreciate the opportunity to get to speak with you all today. My name is Carlton Laster. I'm 33. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, and even though I'm from Ohio, my day job is I'm the director of policy and organizing for Outfront Minnesota, the statewide advocacy organization for LGBTQ issues uh, in the state. And so had a busy legislative session that ended not too long ago. Um, I've been a lobbyist my entire career, which is about a decade at this point. I'm at various levels of government and various sectors, public and private and nonprofit alike. Um, I love to clearly write in my free time. I've done creative writing and, and various forms of writing since, you know, middle school for me as a young kid. I went to Ohio State and got my bachelor's degree with honors at, in English. And then I went to Northwestern and got my master's in public policy and administration. Um, so, yeah, so just been uh, doing a whole lot. And, and, and really the focus of my writing is based on my personal experience and how race and culture uh, and identity, whether it's me being bisexual or um, having grown up in, in, in Cleveland and in a middle income family, working class family, and how all these things kind of over intersect and overlap and also spirituality as well into into daily life and how, um, especially in, in millennial culture nowadays, because uh, I am a millennial, just what what does that look like? I, I think every generation has been able to have some people uh, tell their stories and how life and art and all these things, culture, um, are for that period. But I don't necessarily think it's been captured as much well in the written form. I think we have a lot of TikTok videos and things like that, which, of course, will live on forever. But um, I do think we've got to do a much better job in terms of capturing the written history of millennial culture as it's going and especially as it gets older into more leadership positions and and things like that. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I resonate a lot with, with the sentiments that you had there. I too am a Midwesterner. I, uh, I grew up in Michigan outside of Flint. I went to the University of Michigan. So you know, we can have a different conversation at some other yeah, point we'll about a football combo oh, later. Uh-huh, <laughs> absolutely. But very much also a a millennial, although I think I fall somewhere on what they call elder millennials, which I, I think is a hilarious term. But you're right. I think we have a lot of social media. You know, most of us had the benefit of a, a pretty sort of low tech childhood existence. We had, you know, some family videos that were taken from some camcorders and a few point and shoot cameras that were really blurry, thankfully. But, you know, a lot of us spent kind of our early adult years in that social media world. And I think uh, for me, you know, I can't, (laughs) I know you can't speak for our whole generation either, but I think a lot of people are really wanting those histories and stories as, you know, podcasts seem to be exploding. I've heard things like slow TV being a thing now where people just like watch YouTube videos of trains in Denmark or some state or country. And I think we just want that deeper connection that that isn't there just through pure social media sharing alone. Yeah, I think that it's very uh, pressing and, and just important to like to capture that. I think Especially nowadays, folks are looking to slow down because everything is so fast and everything is happening so fast. So I think it is important to um, figure out what is and figure out what is the appropriate pace. How do we get uh, right so that we aren't constantly burnt out? And, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it, and I think that ties us nicely into 
why I reached out to you and why I was hoping to have this conversation with you today. And because your piece brought up this idea of co-conspirators. And for those who haven't come across that term before or haven't read your article yet, how would you define what it means to be a co-conspirator? And how might that differ from being, you know, just a an ally? Yeah, so thank you. So the piece I wrote recently, need more co-conspirators, fewer, less allyship is an idiom. And I, I think for me, co-conspirators, as I mentioned in the piece, is that we spoke to, and when I say folks, I'm generally going to say non-Black uh, people across various spectrums, whether they're LGBTQ uh, or hetero or whatever it might be, um, to be in the struggle for, specifically I mentioned, intersectional fight for liberation of Black and LGBTQ peoples and being willing to sacrifice and specifically when looking at white people, putting their whiteness and the privilege and the, uh, uh, I guess you can, for a lack of better, uh, for a lack of a better term, you can say the hegemony that comes with being white aside, being willing to sacrifice that for the greater good. And the cases I use, unfortunately, uh, they feature the deaths or, or in, well, in some cases, you say martyrdom of many white folks who uh, gave up their lives or, or, or were willing to sacrifice their whiteness for a, be- for a better cause um, during the civil rights movement. And that does not always have to be the case where one has to sacrifice their life. But I do think it is important to sacrifice or be willing to sacrifice the privilege that, and, and access and power that comes from whiteness in order to lift up and be, and really to elevate though that specific group, whether it is black people or LGBTQ people, whoever it might be, to see that their liberation is front and center, that their voices are front and center, that they are being willing to engage in the sacrifice work that is that is needed to make that attainable. And that is different from allyship because so often we see allyship in a very commercialized form. We see that from recently, as I mentioned in the article, Target. We see that with Taylor Swift and, and some of the uh, performative allyship that's come with that. We've seen it with folks that say like, oh, well, you know, I've got black, black or brown or whoever coworker or neighbor but that is but that is not true co-conspiratorship for their liberation that is just adjacent proximity or it's just saying like hey I, I'm affiliated by some sort of other necessity with these people not that I am invested in their success liberation and and true access to uh, human humanity and, and civil rights, um, because that 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 can still be uh, detached in many forms of allyship. Allyship does not require uh, that level of investment and care and sacrifice. It's just, it's very transactional in some ways, and it's also very passive um, and not necessarily, and reactive and not necessarily um, active and, and really promoting, willing to um, be a radical, I, I guess you could say, uh, for for what is right for everyone. Yeah, yeah, you you make some very very good points and needed points. I think allyship as a as a white cis um, mostly abled man, it, I've benefited a lot from my own privileges, and of course, in recent years, have had to reconcile with some of the. Um, the not great things that I've also benefited from, benefited from, even even if I wasn't an, an active participant in in those particular forms of discrimination or systemic oppressions, it was it still benefited me over somebody else. And for as long as that exists, it's it's not ever going to be equitable. And again, as a as a person trying to do some of this work, I've always felt that, particularly as we mentioned with the social media piece. People like to claim their allies, d- despite their actions acting very differently 
or or simply becoming an ally and and sort of taking over a space uh, and i and i know you mentioned white folks as dominant drivers of this and i very much agree and it's that it seems to be that sort of white saviorism that comes with sort of allyship and that just look look at sort of the superficial thing i'm doing without ever actually being uncomfortable with with how things are really inequitable and so what what drove you to write about co-conspirators and why choose pride? And you know this, this is a, uh, an audio medium, right? We're on a podcast, so they can't see that I very sarcastically wrote the trademark sign next to pride, tra- attributing some of that capitalistic you to it. But why pick pride to talk about co-conspiracies when we've certainly had many, many other opportunities to talk about the, the issues with allyship? Yeah, so to answer your first question, what brought me to point and, and, and specifically co-conspiratorship. So it's, it ha- it's how the article opens. And I opened talking about how I was listening to a sermon because uh, I am, uh, grew up in the black church. And so I, li- I do go to church and, and watch sermons. And so I was listening to a sermon from the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago. Uh, is from Cleveland originally, and so they followed his ministry for a long time. In his sermon, he was talking about how disciples of Jesus during what is now known as Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended upon them um, and, and and inspired them to then go out amongst uh, the world in various forms, spread the gospel, and eventually all were give up their lives and martyrdom for uh, that spread of the gospel. They were talking about how they became co-conspirators, not just allies of Jesus, because to be an ally of Jesus would be to say, after Jesus died and, and rose again, just go about your everyday life. But to then be convicted and convicted with the Holy Spirit to then go out and, and really minister and, and grow the faith, what it is now, in many ways, you become a token to invested in, in that ministry and how that then mirrors what from white allyship into white token spiritorship for liberation of black, brown, LGBTQ today. And so that's where it originated. And then to answer your second question on why pride so just I'll be 100% transparent. June is my birth month. So uh, June 2nd was my birthday. So we're in June. It's my birthday. And then I think of like how many intersections come in this month. And of course, we know it's the midway point of a calendar year in the sixth month, 12. And then to think that, hey, this is entirely Pride Month. And then now in many, in almost every aspect of life, have June 19th off for Juneteenth, which celebrates the delayed emancipation of slaves in Texas. And how those two things mirror my life as well in terms of being a Black and LGBTQ identifying person. Um, it all just wraps up into one. And so I, I was uh, to kind of stick with another term I used earlier, convicted with, with a with a sense to want to talk about why this is important, why being a co-conspirator and and being not and not just calling folks out, but being willing to call them in as, at the time to say like, hey, yes, what you've done has has not has been insufficient, but there are ways to to bring you to the table a co-conspirator if that is what. And I think in many ways, part of it is reclaiming the term focus spirit because it does have such negative connotations and origins. And it's, and just like anything complicated, it's nuanced. It, it, there is not always and has not always been a, a negative connotation to, to co-conspiratorship. There, because we co-conspire to do a lot of things, good, bad, and in between. But I think because of, you know, recent history and how that term has been used, whether it's through uh, the actions on January 6th and um, just, you know, politic- politicization of those things and and whatnot, I think it has gained such a tarnished and negative viewpoint. But like I say, it has a complicated legacy. Like, it, it can be positive. Um, in many ways, go back to see 
years ago, they were probably calling many of the folks in the civil rights movements co-conspirators. And folks were, when you're looking at any of the programs and, and, and the Cointel Pro that the FBI did, and whether it was civil rights leaders or that they labeled as communist or whatever it was, they were likely uh, attached the moniker co-conspirator. But we clearly know that that was not always about the cause and the justification. Sure. And you brought me right to my next point. And cause most of my, my scholarly work, and, and of course, what we talk about in this podcast, often refers to disability and not just disability rights, but disability justice. And so often, even when I'm teaching undergraduate students, I bring up just like a historical partnership where groups like the Black Panthers and those disability rights advocates who were doing the 504 sit-ins in the 70s, you know, really at, at sort of the peak height of the civil rights era, era a lot of those advocacy groups were really co-conspirators for one another, really making sure that Every single group, of course, was helping lift up in, in many ways, trying to at least. How might we, and I use that, of course, very royally, how might, how might we, those who are bought into this, how might, how might we be better co-conspirators for each other? So that's, that is such an important question, and it's probably the central question uh, we should all be asking. Um, and I think that, and I won't proclaim to know or, or have all of the answers, uh, but in my opinion, I believe that it is a spectrum and it's a, and it's a progress, a process. You have to, it's going to take some time to get to that point. Um, and I believe that for many, at once it, once jo the George Floyd situation happened in 2020, you saw the flood of what I would call white sympathy for uh, civil rights and, and racial justice and other intersectional issues uh, where folks were buying a whole lot of books, whether it was white fragility and all these things, how we even got Juneteenth as a national holiday. Uh, and then it kind of just fizzled. But we have to go beyond the willingness to do that performative allyship of reading about right, white fragility and being able to have it as a, a conversation, a dinner conversation with someone else or with a family member, but to really invest in what does that look like in one's daily life. I think it's something, it could be something as simple as having being, the process of being so conspirator could be as simple as having a black person, your house, for dinner on, say, a, a weekly or monthly, bi-weekly or monthly basis. Because when you think about it, how many times has either you or or just a average everyday white person had a, had a black family or a bisexual or LGBT or indigenous over their house for dinner? I can tell you the likelihood of that is very low. Um, and And not have it within the context of like a work situation or something like that uh, or party, but actually just a one-on-one -on -one dinner with between families or people. Um, I think that is is one way to break the ice because that is how you then begin to have conversations and truthful conversations about what and see where your privilege uh, comes in, what has been the impact of white hegemony on, on, on American culture and society. I think another example in order to start that process, go beyond the academic and then, and really go into the practical. So what if, say you are in, and I'm not using you, for example, but if you are an academic study or social work or something like that, what does, and, and you know, the theoretical and the academic causes for like poverty and things like that. But what are you, but I would say to be a co-conspirator, what are you actually doing? Go outside of that research or academic mindset to go into these teams, to really invest, create programs, to, to be embedded in the culture and not in a performative way, but being, do, doing it authentically and being willing to allow that community and that, and those 
execute key services you're providing, um, a seat at the table and not just a seat at the table, but the vo- their voices to be heard and for them to even assume leadership of how that process takes. Because we always say that the t- in business that the customer knows best. However, when it comes to uh, addressing racial or societal or, or cultural issues like this, we rarely ever want to allow, allow the customer who the oppressed community in this case to be the people who know best and to answer and address their questions and, and problems. And so we have, and, and, and so we have to be willing as a larger culture, and I even include myself in this because I recognize that even though I don't have white privilege, I'm an educated black man um, and, and I have resources and, and access to things that other folks. And so I even have to bring myself into this where I am figuring out how can I bring my skill set resources to bear and be willing to follow and, and, and help shepherd the process in a way that is culturally respectful, that is relevant to me, that, that said oppressed me is experiencing, and that is going to create a long-term relationship and um, positive and foster positive long-term sustainable outcomes. So that is what I think. I know that's a long answer. <laughs> no, I love it. I think that was a great message. And you kind of started into my next question and gave us a lot of really good practical ways that someone can move just beyond allyship or uh, and be or or start to try to be a co-conspirator what advice might you have for somebody who who might be at the very beginning of of their journey into this their you know Maybe they have or haven't picked up white fragility. They they maybe haven't invited um, their black friend over for a for a dinner as friends again, not as some social experiment or or anything along those lines. But what might be sort of the first step they might take in in yeah, in, I think, in that journey? Yeah, yeah. I think the first step and it's. And it's what I do in my work as a lobbyist. So a lot of my work is about building relationships, sustaining those relationships, being persuasive in conversation uh, about policy to move the legislators, excuse me, legislators or decision makers votes one way or the other. And I think what I've told folks in lobby who are interested in coming to lobby, first thing you have to do is actually two things. Be authentic. And listen, because you, because if you listen more than you talk, you get, you're able to, to move mountains. And especially if you can listen actively and really not just nod your head and say, Oh yeah, that's, that's great. But really be able to do that listening into it and, and have it into a productive conversation where you're bouncing back questions. You're, you're posing hypotheticals and talking about like, what are the impacts? Really getting a, a substantive understanding as to what, where persons uh, and their opinions are coming from and what they're rooted in is important. Do it authentically. And I've, like, I've done this as a lobbyist and I've been able to do it successfully in Republican states because full disclosure, I'm a Democrat and been able to get things done well in that sense. And I think in many cases for those that are starting that those two, same two things being authentic and being a strong, active listener is is probably the most important because so often when it comes, especially to racial, um, white white people come in camp. They either want to over talk and apologize, or they want to over talk and validate their bigotry and why their position they believe in is right, as opposed to actually truly listening actively and respectfully in a way to understand why these cultures, whether it's black, indigenous. AAPI or whoever it might be uh, have have come to this feeling and, and to this moment of, of crisis in many ways. I think, and then also to be authentic because another example is I think when I was really, um, watching a movie, like it was with Jonah Hill uh, and Eddie Murphy talked to people and it had, and it was basically like a modern day spin on who, guess who's coming to dinner. Um, and, and so uh, in many of those examples, which actually do kind of play out in real life, you see white folks often 
like I say, doing the performative allyship thing, like, oh, well, you know, I have some black friends or I've worked with somebody and they're, and they use words like, oh, they're really articulate or things like that, which are, which is very coded bias language, things like that. And, and then just fumble over themselves when, or they try to overperform to show that they're like really supportive and, and come in with like cornrows and it's like, come on now. So, <laughs> so it, but I think for me and for most, and I, and I would hope for most people that come in at, come at it authentically, understanding and having a true self-awareness, you are where your privilege is, where it is and where it's not in certain spaces. L- understanding how that has been a differentiating factor in, in the two cultures, uh, trajectories and, and outcomes, and then also being willing to be authentic and to say like, hey, I know what I, this is what I know, this is what I don't know, but I'm willing to learn. I want to, I want to learn and I'm not going to do it in a way that is offensive. I'm going to do it in a way that can hopefully be a continuing bridge or continuing conversation to improvement and, and, and understand that, that one person or, or that person won't have all the answers and won't address systemic racism and all these things, uh, through, through, through this conversation or work, but, it is a step for them and hopefully a step for the reciprocating person that they're talking to to bridge to to break the ice and, and bridge some of these uh harms that have been historically and and yeah it's almost like a ripple in a pond right you hope that sort of one good act kind of leads into another and another and another and then it and eventually gets big enough to, to take on those systemic oppressions how how might somebody <laughs> know if they've fallen into being an ally and they're not doing co-conspirator work like what's a red flag somebody if they're self-evaluating looks at themselves and go oh no <laughs> I've, I've done something I'm, I'm an ally now what might be something they'd look for i think one thing would be that in any relationship or friendship or or dynamic, there's always going to come a point where you have a disagreement about something uh, and say you're having a disagreement with a black friend about, and we'll just use it because it's going to be a Supreme Court decision about it soon, affirmative action. And, and you're taking a different position um, than, say, the likely position of a, of a black friend. Then, and, and you staunchly stand in that position without any sort of understanding or, 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 or respect as to how that specific, uh, like I say, historical harm has been, has been done or, or recognized for in the case of affirmative action, why it has been a tool of uplift for many people and, and equity in, in a system that, that provides very little wiggle room for equity or uplift for non-white people. Uh, I think that is, I think that is a problem. I think to I think another thing that we've seen is and and have encountered I would say as a black person almost many times is especially when when looking at white women in this is when they start crying. Yes. Or 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 or, or, or the conversation become that is about the about the harm done to one group when the conversation pivots that centers whiteness. And it does it in a way that makes them the victim and, and that makes them both the victim and also the party that needs rectification at the same time. So like, it's like, how does that, how does that work? <laughs> You're constantly looking like, what, what sense does this make? <laughs> it, it's a lot of mental gymnastics. I don't even exactly. get it most days. Exactly. So. Exactly. And so when you get into those things, I think that is and just, you know, you, we all know what a defensive posture looks like when folks start getting into a conversation or, or, or feel a difference in opinion and and you for one be- reason or another whether it's our uh, natural instinct of fight or flight you just get defensive and we feel like our back is against the wall and have to overly substantiate our opinion i think that's when you're starting to get into that allyship as opposed to co-conspiratorship to really center the conversation on 
once again, what is the overall uplift for everyone? How are we doing it in a way? How are we ensuring that we are creating power dynamic structures that aren't centered on whiteness, but are, but is centered on equity, um, and fairness, um, and, and things like that. And so the, the red flags are, are fairly apparent and but sometimes, and I think they're, of course, more apparent for those that are on the receiving end of it, as opposed to those that are doing sure. it. So, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now you uh, bring up a lot for us and great conversation. I've really enjoyed thinking about it. It seems that with kind of, if I was to summarize it, I'd, I'd say, you know, allyship is, is where you're, you think you're, you're trying to help another community, but the center is you're focused on yourself instead of co-conspiratorship where, yeah, you're showing up, but you're focused on their mission or the, the mission of the group as opposed to centering your own need. You're showing up for their mission and, and centering it on their need. But also, I think it is that investment of equity and it's also the sacrifice of whiteness, it, 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 it hegemony and its supremacy. Those are words I'm going to keep going back to. That's where a lot of is the basis for a lot. Um, Absolutely. And, and, and you're willing to sacrifice the privileges of those things doing. And I think I, I mentioned it at the, at the end of my piece, uh, being able to sacrifice an easy wrong or easy middle way for a hard right choice. Doing the right thing that is going to be hard. It's going to be painful. And it's not going to be uh, quick and it's not going to be. Um, something you can kind of just, hey, do, do it once and, and, and it's done. It, it requires so much continual care and act. Um, that be able to do that, that is being a coping spirit as opposed to an ally. Yeah. It's being, yeah, being comfortable in that discomfort. Right. And yeah. So we've, you've given us a lot to think about and, and to consider. And now I want to shine the light on you. So, Tell us, this is your moment to plug whatever you want to plug, self-promote. What are you working on? You know, what's exciting you now? What's coming up? And and where can people find more from you? Yeah, I appreciate this opportunity and this conversation. It's been a pleasure. And, and please, can, how I can continue to support the work that you all are doing. Um, I you. will say that I continue to write on my Spare time, it'll be like that. I use my medium page, which is my name okay. across the platform. And then uh, the work that I've been doing, as I mentioned, the director of policy and organizing for Out Front Minnesota, had a really busy and, pro and successful and progressive uh, legislature uh, that, that just wrapped up. We were able to pass many bills that supported LGBTQ. We were able to pass the conversion therapy ban on my, for my we were uh, executive order and bill. At first, we was able to get Governor Walt to sign an executive order, able to uh, the legislature to pass a uh, bill on there that makes Minnesota a welcoming place for gender affirming care um, at, for both families and and also the providers and medical personnel in that work as well. And then we were also able to pass some bills that made having prep accessible through the state uh, health insurance as well as yeah as well as creating a council for lgbtq minnesotans so that's huge counter to what much of the rhetoric has been going on across the country where there's been anti-trans legislation and for me it's about not just promoting lgbtq work but finding as to how does it impact those at the intersection so i continually ground my work in how is this helping of black indigenous and enemies of color how is this helping low income um folks and how is this uh, helping those at the margins and in many other facets and and how is it bringing folks together and so um many of much of this legislation has, has been supremely positive and looking to come up with some strong bills um, next year like i said i'll continue to write i actually have a piece that i think i'm going to work on to get out before juneteenth that talk about uh joy and rest and, yes. how, um, <laughs> it, it, and how my therapist has been uh, pushing me to, uh, to to live and find joy through rest. And so I'm going to talk about that. So stay tuned and, and you'll see that on my post that my social media is my, is my Carlton Laster. 
So yeah, I'm just really excited and, and, and excited to get back to reading because it's my time where I can kind of chill and do some reading like that. So that, um, that sounds wonderful. And I'm going to keep your number on speed dial because I'm going to need to get some advice on how to tackle our legislature down here in Texas, which is one of the worst ones, like I would say. So I, I will. I Yes, I know I've been in conversation with some folks at Equality Texas, I believe, before yeah. and many, other of our, many of our other partners, partner organizations in other parts of the state through, through uh, larger national organizations like Trevor Project and HRC Day coordinating Connect Us. So I know what's going on down there. And if there's ways we can help, let us know. Absolutely. I will. I will keep you in touch. But Carlton, thank you so much for talking with me today, for your candor, for sharing your stories. I've really enjoyed it. I, I hope our listeners have as well. I wish you the best of Pride Months and have a wonderful and restful Juneteenth. Yes, thank you so much. Have a great one. And, and thank your audience as well for listening and, and continue to do the great work. Excellent. All right. Have a great one. Yep, you too. Bye. Welcome back to Disability Movement, etc. As we come back from that conversation, we do our podcast episode tradition of sharing our crip, or if we're feeling pessimistic, anti-crip of the week. Andy, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can go first. And I'm spreading a wide casting net that's also a self-nomination, I guess, for crip of the week. And that is my crip of the week is all the disabled academic scholars at universities who should be or have already received their letters getting tenured and promotion. Congratulations to all of you. It was it's a very hard road. It's not easy, no matter what you hear in the popular news media, particularly though for disabled academics who often have to fight even more of an uphill battle to get tenure and are not well represented among the academe faculty. Congratulations, and that's a self pat on the back to me. John. Who who do you have for your crypto week? Congrats. Don't stop here. non illegitimi carborundum. Uh, what other false Latin can I come up with? Um, if people don't know what non illegitimi carborundum means, don't let the bastards grind you down. Uh, excellent. I'm going to get that carved into a piece of wood hung over my desk. Yes. <laughs> Send it to the Board of Regents. Whenever. Um, my crip of the week is that uh, through the circles that I used to run in, <laughs> not actually run in, in Paris sport, came across my feed that the Michigan High School Sports Association uh, was requesting letters from Michigan schools expressing their support for the permanent inclusion of the wheelchair category in, in Paris sport in, in their high school track. Now, what continually not to be a pessimist, my crips of the week are the people who are participating. There was a number of photos in this post. I, I don't know the people participating. This just ended up on my feed. And the reason I bring this up is that uh, this is one of those topics where it shouldn't surprise me, and yet it occasionally does, that we are still having this argument. I mean, the people who sued, because they often had to do a lawsuit. So, you know, I guess Michigan isn't at the stage of a lawsuit. Um, uh, the people who had to sue for this to be included in other in other jurisdictions are people that I played basketball with 10 years ago, right? These are lawsuits by people who would go on to be Paralympians or, or notable athletes. They weren't Paralympians, university level coaches of their sports who were suing them in the 2011 to 2015 time period. Um, I haven't seen or heard an update about whether this they were doing a pilot program, whether that has been extended, but realistically, High school track. I competed in high school track. I have a silver medal. There was only two competitors. Um, yeah, I'm on a banner in my high school, which always makes me laugh. People are like, wow, you were a great athlete. I was like, mm, no, I was there. You're the second best. Um, so, yeah, so I was <laughs> there. That's that's all I took in Saskatchewan to be there. Um, I wasn't very good at going around in circles. However, more the kudos to those who made this happen. We were talking about allyship, co-conspiratorship. Those the both will have been needed in this situation, I'm quite sure. And hopefully Michigan High School Sports Association can join the on the right side of history of allowing track 
athletes. I don't know, particularly in Michigan's case, often this is an argument as to whether their points can count, even if beyond the beyond actual inclusion and not just chucking you in the middle of a race. So hopefully that that inclusion happens and we start to see more athletes out of the out of the state of Michigan, which already has a fair representation when it comes to the parasport in the world. Um, yeah. And and as a Michigander, I'm very happy about the trajectory of my former home state with a lot of the progressive ideals that they've been putting forward. And I mean, they join Minnesota, I think, if this goes through and like I haven't followed up with the lawsuit either. So I don't know what stage it's at, but they would, uh, you know, Minnesota, Maryland, some other states are also doing some really good stuff in terms of this is for memory listeners. Here's a rabbit hole you can fall down. But from memory, Minnesota, Illinois thing is you can never because quite often it starts with the wheelchair track and then you see an additional lawsuit or discussion around things like blind athletes. And then you have another discussion around intellectually developmentally delay athletes. These are always the sort of additive processes. But yeah, from memory, Michigan would join a place like Illinois, Arizona. Yeah. Midwest has got a few states and there's a, there's a couple others to bring around, but it's good stuff. So everybody keep it up. We're rooting for you. Yeah. All and right, John. We'll, we'll see you next episode. Yeah. We'll, we'll be off next week, but we'll be back with another week after that. So, John... You take care of yourself. I'll talk to you. I love to talk to you as always, but um, we'll be here soon. We'll see you all later. Bye. Disability Movement Etc. is a Blank Owl production. You can find out more about what we're doing, including past episodes, show notes, and transcripts at blankowl.com. Music for this episode was composed by Adrian Doc Blust. If you'd like to support our efforts with Blank Owl, head over to support.blankowl.com. I hope you all join us next time.